Okay, we're going to get started. So this is uh, this session is called the Path to Open Pilot, uh, Open Books Pilot, uh, a sustainable bo uh, model for making university press front list titles open access at scale. I'm Charles Watkinson. I'm a director of University of Michigan Press, uh, and we have here um, Emma Moles, um, we have Rebecca Seeger, and we have James Shulman. And big thanks for some of the slides to Charla Lair from Lyricis who was also one of the uh, people who brainstormed the creation of this model. So just a quick introduction to Path to Open. This is a lot of text, so you, uh, but these slides and this presentation will be made available um, after, the, um, after the event. But um, this is uh, just a problem statement, and uh, I think you're familiar with um, the declining sales of monographs uh, and that long-term decline in terms of the sales model for scholarly specialist monographs. Um, and just a certain amount of concern among book publishers about immediate OA, just a little bit of concern about the, um, the sources of funding that will actually cover the costs of producing a high quality scholarly monograph. And then just for the majority of publishers, um, in the humanities and qualitative social sciences, OE looks pretty scary. And that's because they're very small. And we tend to think of university presses as Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Princeton or whoever, you know. But actually, if you think about university presses, um, over half the members of the Association of University Presses, and that has 160 members, have annual revenues under $1.5 million. And most of them have much smaller revenue. So that's something that people really forget, that most university presses are really, really small publishers. And they don't have a lot of capacity to deal with complexity. And OA is a very complicated environment. So that has led to, I think, a very patchy picture of lots of pilots. And also, pilots tended to be run by presses with the resources to do so. So I think of University of Michigan Press with our terrific support from the library, MIT Press and Nick and the large press, Cambridge, Oxford. And as you think about OA pilots out there, you'll probably recognize that there are lots of publishers who are not in them and are not part of that picture. And of course, the publishers are getting very mixed messages from their authors. There's still a lingering concern about OA reputation. And there are also some mixed messages from libraries in that uh, a very small proportion of the library um, of, of libraries actually do support OA programs. Because why would one support something that doesn't have unique benefit to your parent organization when you have to defend that to your provost, to the person that you're responsible for? And of course, beyond our large research libraries that so many of the presses are embedded in, there's, um, you know, resource poorness is a very, very real thing. And of course, in the research library place. Um, so, and I will point out this last point is very important. So, OA models based on book publishing charges exclude researchers in underserved populations. I mean, I think that's so obvious that it doesn't deserve saying anymore, but I think perhaps we need to say it again and again. Book, book processing charge uh, models tend to disadvantage people who don't have wealthy institutions behind them or wealthy funders. So, how does Path to Open work? So academic institutions pay an annual subscription fee to access a growing corpus of titles exclusively available on JSTOR. After three years, those titles become open access on all platforms. So this is a delayed open access model based on subscription revenue. Uh, 100 titles will be published um, uh, in 2023. So those are 100 titles coming onto the JSTOR platform available to subscribing libraries by the end of 2023. And then this program will quite rapidly scale. And this is a pilot. So everything depends on how well um, that uh, process goes. As of uh, April 1st, there were 32 university presses um, signed up to contribute uh, for the 2023 year um, uh, and more coming on board for the term of the pilot. 
It's crucial to remember that only participating libraries will provide institutional access to the titles during the first three years after publication, and that's only on the JSTOR platform. At the start of the third year, following the publication date, titles will be converted to OA. So that would be January 2026 for the 2023 title. So in fact, it's less than a three-year um, delay for titles published later in the year. There will be an independent governance group hosted by ACLS, which will provide oversight of the P2O model. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit and making some assumptions. James may want me to tail that down a bit, but uh, that is in process of being created, and I hope I'm not making too many assumptions. Participating presses receive a guaranteed $5,000 per title a year after each book is accepted. So that's crucial. JSTOR is saying, we guarantee you whatever happens with this pilot, if we don't make enough money, we will still pay you as presses $5,000 guaranteed in the second year. So between January and March of the second year, 2024 for 2023 titles, each press will receive $5,000 per title. That's guaranteed. The books will be available in print and e-consumer versions, but not in any other library aggregation. And the aim there is to minimize library workflow challenges and overhead costs. Like it's gonna be com complicated enough as a library to kind of work out which books are in which collection, et cetera, without having the added burden of working out which platform you can get them on as well. And the more complexity that JSTOR has to manage, the lower the payout to the publishers. When books are converted to OA, they will be available to be published on any platform the university press selects in addition to JSTOR, and they will be indexed in the directory of open access books. And Neil Stern has left leaflets completely blank, no, on this side, you can see it, uh, and pens that he's carried all the way from Scandinavia on this in front of you. So if you don't know about directory of open access books, uh, this is the thing to look at and take one of his pens or two. Um, and then uh, finally, presses select CC by NC 4.0 for books when converted to OA. However, we want to center the authors in this. So if they do want to have a more restrictive license or a less restrictive license, uh, we have to be flexible to accommodate that. And here's just a, you know, a few logos of the uh, 30 plus publishers. And um, I'm not gonna read them all, but I want you to see that it's a pretty broad range of different types of university presses, and it actually skews towards the smaller ones. So for the first time, presses like University of Arkansas Press, I talked to the director there, who's a very sharp, he's actually uh, you know, an accountant by training, very sharp thinker, and he said, for the first time I see an open access program that I can get behind. So these are the presses that have previously not been able to participate in this landscape. And it's an on-ramp, the three-year delay, for other initiatives maybe moving towards more immediate open access. But this is trust building again, trust, the number one term for CNI 2023. And you'll see it's international presses as well as uh, US-based and Canadian presses. And I really want to hammer and hammer on this whole theme of these smaller publishers. Path to Open supports a bibliodiversity of university presses. So bibliodiversity was a term that really started in multilingual, uh, uh, in terms of multilingualism in Europe and actually in Latin America to start off with. But it's really a relevant term for thinking about the book landscape and the book publishing landscape where there's this incredible long tail of publishers who have a very distinctive regional disciplinary disciplinary cultural identity. And if you look at the picture here that shows university presses across the US and Canada, you'll see that regionality suddenly spring out. And of course, university presses publish regional books, but when they publish academic books, they publish through the lens of regionality. So University of Georgia Press is a civil rights, has a very, very good civil rights list. Uh, university of British Columbia Press is very, very good on indigenous studies. Uh, and as you look across this landscape, you'll see regional as well as disciplinary diversity represented. And preserving that bibliodiversity, it really has to be a core goal of libraries and also of the parent institutions uh, that uh, benefit from these books being published. 
The path to open timeline, I think the crucial thing is um, April 15th, 2023, that's when you'll see the list of uh, titles, and January 2026, which is when those titles will go open, and you'll see uh, other collections being launched over the next couple of years. So I'm gonna pass over to Emma now for how does PTO contribute to the OA book landscape, and just tell me when to forward, Emma. Okay, great, um, this microphone is on? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Emma Moles. I'm uh, the director of open research and publishing at the University of Minnesota. And I think to step back for a moment and talk about the landscape as a whole is important. Another thing I, I, I want all of you to keep in mind, because it's primarily more where my work happens, is thinking about communicating this landscape with our faculty authors on campus, which um, can, can be a whirlwind for a number of reasons. So next slide. I wanted to come out with that joke where you have a piece of paper and then it suddenly unfurls and it's really long um, <laughs> to, to kind of give a, a, a little bit of a taste of the business models that we see right now happening in open access book publishing. So here is a table um, actually created by OEPIN. This is on their website of the business models. So you may know them um, by, by other terms, um, but we have all the way from uh, book publishing charges or BPCs through freemium, institutional subsidies, library publishers, library membership models, consortial and institutional crowdfunding, and individual crowdfunding. So here on this slide, it lists some examples. I think it's actually helpful to maybe take, um, take one of the publishers that each of us are familiar with and see where this kind of lines up on the table. Um, so there's, there's a wide variety here. Uh, I'm gonna uh, pick out one actually at the, at the top here, which is the uh, Tome program that was a pilot project that ra just ran the last uh, handful of years. Um, that was something on my campus where it took a lot of communication with our authors in our College of Liberal Arts to really understand what was happening because it sort of followed something that they were very familiar with, but the outcome was something that they were not familiar with, right, an, an, an open access monograph. So what does that mean to authors? What does this mean for authors who may end up publishing with a variety of presses over their careers? And as we see more uh, business models introduced, how are these conversations working? Next slide. On the other side of that, we have um, sort of ourselves as library funders. Um, so I think, again, this is where maybe like the long list that continuously unfurls um, would be a, a nice representation too. So these are some uh, of the programs right now that are seeking library funding. Um, many of you are likely a lot more familiar with some of these than others, uh, but I'm sure there's probably an email in your inbox that is introducing this program or giving you an update on some of these programs that are, that are looking for funding. Um, so again, a wide variety of, uh, of, of programs that are looking for library funding. That amount of money can really vary across the, uh, across the different programs. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit deeper dive into some of those programs that were on the last uh, slide. So when we think about conditional open access models for books, that would be programs that the, the condition, of course, is based on uh, the amount of support, in many cases, the number of libraries that sign on to, to, to support that initiative or program. Um, so again, some familiar programs on this list, including ones we've heard about throughout uh, the yesterday and today's program. Direct to Open is an, access, uh, is an example of this. Uh, MIT Press um, flips titles uh, upon publication to, uh, to open access via support from libraries. Path to Open is also on the bottom of this slide um, that shows, of course, where that fits in. We have a, a difference here, a, a notable difference, and um, Charles told me uh, to say, uh, is delayed open access even open access? Oh no, you said I shouldn't <laughs> say that. That's what you that. shouldn't say. That's right. <laughs> but again, I, I think that is important for us to know across programs, but also to communicate with our authors. So those of us who are doing a lot of outreach on campus, I think it's important to understand that our, our faculty authors really need to be brought along in this conversation and that outreach and communication can be complicated if we leave it solely on the presses or publishers to do some of that. So thinking about where, where we as librarians really fit into this, um, communicating these, these models on campus. Next slide. Um, this is a, a, a fairly uh, wordy slide that I, I think the, the important thing um, is if you're a fast reader and reading through this list, you'll notice that there's uh, 
a, not a ton of difference when we think about the revenue models uh, for non-BPC uh, open access programs. So the conditional open access versus the collective and crowd, crowdsourcing or membership models, we actually see a lot of commonalities across the, the different attributes um, of each of these models. Next slide. Um, finally, just a quick word on where we are seeing the funding, uh, the funders or the funding community come from. Uh, this map uh, is probably going to look like it's actually missing a lot of um, pin drops, but I think this matches up with what we've seen in other open access um, funding, funding models. So a lot of these funders are coming from, um, from Europe, from the U.S. and Canada, a lot of well-resourced uh, 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 libraries in, in many cases that are, that are jumping on board to fund some of these open access models. So I hope that kind of gives a little bit of an overview of where we stand in this moment, at least on open access uh, book publishing, and gives an idea of where Path to Open fits in across what is really a, a fairly wide variety of programs and models that are happening. Emma, thank you so much. And uh, thank you again to Sharla for um, those uh, useful structuring uh, concepts and for that map. So what are we finding in terms of publisher reactions? Um, so, so far, um, what do they like? What do we like, publishers? Fits with existing workflows. We're um, really used to um, the well-worn workflows through which we can deposit to a platform like JSTOR or Project Muse where um, we have these Onyx feeds and we have the content and we just uh, ask our metadata and content distributor, deliver to Muse, deliver to JSTOR, deliver to ProQuest, deliver to EBSCO. So simple. JSTOR is a trusted nonprofit partner. It's not the only one, but it is a trusted nonprofit partner and it's a known entity that has strong loyalty from users. So it's interesting as you talk to faculty and um, students, you know, uh, they will often say JSTOR or Muse as a proxy for quality. So there's a brand association here which is very useful in that space where OA still has a little bit of skepticism and concern among some authors. This is huge, this guarantee of $5,000 per book. That's not the whole cost of publishing a book, but it's a great start. And the other part of this is that we then have an opportunity as publishers to recoup a little bit more of our costs. There's a lot of, um, you know, AU Press's members have really seen a lot of skepticism around the numbers they come up with when they say, this is how much it costs to publish a book. But the thing you have to remember about university presses is there is so much investment in quality control. It starts from the acquisitions editors. Acquisitions editors are expensive highly trained professionals deeply embedded in their disciplines. It goes through the peer review process. It goes through the peer review process again after it's been to the editorial board of faculty members at the institution. You should see the length of some of the reviews that we pay for. Then it goes through a copy editing process, which is more than checking the grammar. It's actually restructuring a lot of the book. And then you have the book coming out. That's expensive. If you don't have acquisitions editors, you lose a lot of the expense, but do we really want to sacrifice that? So, homily over, but $5,000 per book really helps. It provides a third way for authors who want the reach and impact of OA, but still hope that their books will sell. So, at University of Michigan Press, we have this project called Fund to Mission, which is an immediate open access um, program. 75% of our front list, thanks to many of you in this room, will be open access this year. 25% will not. So what we're doing with Path to Open, and it's different by publisher, but what we're aiming to do with Path to Open is whittle away at that 25% by asking why? Why are you worried about open access? And the reasons are often expressed as, I want to have my book open, but not quite yet. I'm up for tenure. My tenure committee is a whole lot of older white dudes. They are not happy with the idea of me doing open access. And I cannot risk my career, but I want openness. Can you delay it three years? Now we can say we can. Another case is a book where the editor says, you know, 
it's got real sales potential, and we want to get it out through Amazon, we want to get it out through all of these supply chains that rely on the ability to sell an ebook. Can't we do a for sale ebook to consumers first? And the answer now is yes, you can. Yes, we can. There are books still that will re remain in our list um, as closed, and those ones are where permissions issues have come in. And that's a whole other conversation that we need to whittle away at. So this is big. Robust usage stats, uh, JSTOR has provided very normalized, robust usage stats uh, since the start. Uh, count of five, total item requests, also um, by country um, and by institution without going too far into, um, into any way of identifying the patron, but identifying by institution. And that's very trusted. And input into governance via the potentially ACLS-hosted governance group. What are they concerned about? Number one thing is exclusivity to JSTOR, restricting access to other library platform partners. And those are, that's really tricky, because this is actually about friendships as well as about um, the whole sort of nasty feeling one has around exclusivity in an open access world. So uh, many of the platform partners, like Project Muse, are run by our friends. Um, they are deeply embedded in our community. That's a very difficult thing for us. Other platform partners, like De Gruyter, are returning great returns to university presses. That's a very difficult, difficult conversation. EBSCO, ProQuest, we've had long partnerships. So this really is a sticky one, and it's probably the biggest problem that the publishers are concerned about. Logistics of managing metadata for a delayed open access book in our systems. This is actually a huge conversation. It's just complicated. Um, access to the ebook for author's own institution. We will be able to work out ways of providing this, but that's a concern when authors come from smaller institutions that may not be able to afford a package, even at the tiered pricing that JSTOR is providing. Fit of a delayed open access model with funder policies that increasingly emphasize immediate open access. So the idea of having this governance group is this can flex. This is about building relationships that can then be built upon to develop new approaches to open in the future with hopefully fewer delays. And exclusion of small for-profit academic publishers without university press in their names. This initial pilot 2023 collection is just university presses, but all of us who are university presses share exhibit booths and share disciplinary conferences with really important, really disciplinarily embedded commercial publishers who are f as for mission as all of us. It's non non-profit, for-profit. I mean, when you're talking about smaller publishers, this is an accident of the tax code. So we want to find ways to include other publishers who everybody recognizes are quality publishers, but just don't happen to have university press in their name. And then I'm over to Rebecca for library reactions. Thank you. Is this microphone working? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so thanks for that, Charles. Um, that was very helpful. Uh, just uh, to be clear, JSTOR's role in this, we, we don't own the Path to Open initiative. This is a, col a loose collaboration at the moment of university presses um, and the ACLS. And they came to us for what I think of as two words, infrastructure and impact. Um, we have the infrastructure, which is the relationships with the presses, as Charles was talking about, but also relationships with 13,000 uh, university uh, libraries worldwide, uh, in addition to a very broad um, individual user, unaffiliated community. Um, so I've been out talking to the community for the past uh, two months, and uh, I'm going to share what uh, the, the good and the bad and, and what we're hearing from, from folks to date. Um, so what librarians have expressed to me that they like about this is the scale. Um, you know, when, when I started talking about 30 presses, 30 small to medium-sized university presses, that is really something that's appealing um, for a number of, of reasons. And um, the, the uh, collaboration of, of the presses in this and the, the scale that we can bring to it is, is really appealing. Um, as Charles talked about bibliodiversity, helping to preserve the types of scholarship uh, and make it more accessible and open in the long run. Um, from these types of presses is, is again, really resonating. I, I hear that a lot, like I'm very concerned about the future for small and medium humanities and social science presses and how we can help them uh, survive and, and their content thrive uh, in a digital space. Um, 
Also, uh, something that's also been appealing is the predictability. We're talking about a three year plus a uh, couple of months pilot um, and that you know we've got, we know what the scope of this is. We're expecting a thousand titles. We're also saying that these 1,000 titles over this time period will be open access um, at the end of this. So that predictability is really helpful. Um, the fee structure, Charles mentioned it briefly. Uh, it's again a collaborative funding model. Um, it reduced costs for everyone for the monographs that are in this program. Uh, and we also scaled it to the, to the JSTOR classification for institutions, which we've had in place since um, uh, uh, the beginning, um, which uh, structures the fees uh, at more affordable for those that can afford less. Um, and that's been really appealing. And interestingly, in the first, we've only been out there for about a month and a half talking about this, but the first group of commitments um, in the first month to this was across the entire range of type of institution from the very small to the very large. Um, so I, I feel like that's um, sort of a, a good indicator that the way we've structured the fees has, has appealed to uh, that group. Um, or no matter what size or type of institution they are. Transparency uh, with the collaboration. Um, again, experimenting with the, with the community in a pilot. Um, and what I mean by transparency is really talking about the why behind um, why, this is, why we're doing it this way, understanding what the challenges for the presses are and talking about it openly, um, getting the feedback from the community and responding to that, um, and being open to learning through this process. And, and uh, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment when I talk about the things that folks are concerned about. Um, so uh, again, uh, as Charles mentioned, as concerning to the publishers as it is to the libraries, is that delayed open access? Um, do, does it need to be that long? Um, and and why, are you, why are you doing that? I get that question probably the most, most often. Um, and what my response to that is, I don't know if three years is too long. Um, and we should be examining that. That's why having the governance uh, structure in place is gonna be really helpful. I don't know if three years might be too long, but in, in monograph land, I worked at Oxford University Press for 20 years before coming to JSTOR three years ago. The first three years of life of a monograph is when 90% of, of the cost recouping comes in. And does this model um, with the, the funding from the library and the consumer sales um, that happens during the, those first three years, does that help publishers, you know, enable them to, to publish in this way? But again, it could be two years, it could be one year. Um, I don't know, um, but I think we need to explore it um, in a very controlled and, and uh, open dialogue with the community. The exclusivity, again, um, you know, is why does it only have to be on JSTOR and, and can we um, explore other ways of making that content available? Um, and I think we should, and we should talk about that as a community, about what makes it sustainable. Um, there has been a lot of feedback when exploring models like um, uh, subscribe to open and others um, around, um, I lost my train of thought there, sorry, I'll come back to that. Um, Title selection, uh, just like Charles was talking about um, uh, on the publisher side, uh, one of the first questions we're asked about this is like, okay, uh, this is really interesting, but what titles are in there? I need to see a title list because there's a lack of trust that these are going to be high quality titles. Anything that goes into open, it must be less than or, or something that's not as, as meaningful as a book that is made available for sale. Um, so that, that has been a really interesting uh, conversation. Reuse rights, uh, Charles mentioned uh, that what, what's being recommended, but that's a question that comes up as well. And, and um, we need to be more transparent about that and find ways to make that available, that information available from the beginning about a, about a title's rights. And um, uh, some other feedback we've had, I had a conversation with the Ivy Plus uh, group, uh, the collections folks and the scholarly communication folks uh, uh, last week. Um, and one of their, their um, questions was, does the model, even though we've scaled the fees, um, and, and the open access delay continue to privilege only those well-funded institutions. And so the um, less well-funded um, and underrepresented communities won't have access to this content for three years. And that seems to go against when we talk about open access. And uh, I think we just need to continue to explore that during, during the, uh, the three years of this pilot. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and James, can I pass over to you for some concluding comments before we open for questions and con conversation? Sure. Uh, I apologize to everyone. I missed the call where we planned the session, so Charles just told me why I'm here. <laughs> Apparently, uh, we're going to be hosting a governance uh, sort of conversation <laughs> around this project, and uh, I'm just kidding. I've been uh, involved in this from the beginning. I want to say uh, first something really quickly about ACLS, because all of you have probably heard of ACLS, but probably f very few of you have any reason 
to know exactly what we do or why we're involved in this. And so just very quickly, the name comes from working with now 79 learned societies from kids, my kids love the learned societies, but um, the academic societies for 100 years now. So we support their work. So that, it's really important because that's a network of scholars in different fields that we work with all the time. And then most people, many people know about, we have fellowship programs, I think we have 14 right now, some that we fund and some that we execute for others. So we work with scholars all the time who are applying for fellowships to write a book or to um, move into the public sector or whatever, to very different fellowship programs. But in that process, we have reviewers and panelists so we, and uh, letter writers. So we work with thousands of scholars all the time. So. Uh, we haven't been that involved in publishing in recent years, um, but we have in, at various points in the past. But I think one thing that I would emphasize is that, um, you know, coming to this project and what I'm going to just say a few comments about what I've learned by working with uh, Charles and John Shearer and others in the publishing community and the library community and talking about this project. Um, one of the things that's kind of obvious from our point of view is that uh, scholars write books and they need to write books and they want to write books in, in humanistic fields and they want people to read them, right? And they want people to read them, and then they want to read other people's books. So what is sort of, if you step way back, what's very sane about a model that increases access to scholarly literature and to books is that it, it helps on that process, okay? So on a very basic level. Um, uh, uh, Rebecca mentioned the term bibliodiversity, which was really interesting for me to think about and learn about in, in working on this project. And it, it very clearly is just that the more financial pressure on presses, the more they're gonna publish another book on the history of the Civil War versus a book in indigenous studies, right? A book that is going to sell less, they're gonna take less risks. So the question here is how can, you know, by subventing with some money from libraries that are already gonna buy, 200 libraries that are already gonna buy these books, subventing the presses so that they can be there to take more risks and to, to uh, increase the diversity of the, the humanistic scholarship that gets published. So that was something that made a lot of sense to us. Um, I, I guess the, um, you know, uh, Peter Baldwin uh, is on our board of trustees, so we have a voice of open access in our ears all the time, which has been terrific. For ACLS, working with the scholarly societies, journal uh, open access in journals are just complicated. It's not that the societies are morally against it, it's just a really complicated question for their model, and some of them are doing things and some will do more things. But books are really a different story. And as Peter says in his book, so if anyone hasn't seen his book, Open Access, from MIT Press, Athena Unbound, that just came out. Um, one of the things he says is, you know, if 200 libraries are gonna spend $75 on a book, that's $1,500, so why not get like more benefit and get, you know, those 200 libraries would get the book, other people, I mean, it's, he's talking about a slightly different model, but his point is the money's already in the system. And if we just squeeze the money to different places, uh, as he says, uh, I don't have the quote, but anyway, basically he says it's no particular difference for the libraries, but it's, the difference for the world is enormous. So this is not a, it's not an immediate open access program, but it, it, is, it, it definitely gets wider access all the time. The last thing I'll, learn, uh, I'll say that I learned, and then I uh, open it up for questions, is that is this question of the quality of the books, right? I mean, because if I'm you and I'm a library, I'm like, I'd like to buy the good books if they come in a package, but I just don't want to buy just a pile of books, right? One of the things that I've learned by thinking about this more and working with others is that a good book, a good book defined by usage or popularity or prizes or anything like that, it's not an act of nature, right? It's not like the tornadoes or the tides. A book doesn't get good because it comes out as a good book or a widely read book. It's a product of how accessed it is and how reviewed it is and how many people know about it and how easy it is to get to. And if it's locked up in 200 libraries that buy the, buy the book, then it, it has to be defined to be a good book in order to get into that. I mean, it's crazy. So these, these books can be good books. These books in, in fields that are still you know, being established, I mean, you know, we got lots of books on Jane Austen, which is great, but there are lots of things out there that need to be said and need to be argued. But they're gonna, if we're gonna be sitting here 25 years from now and saying, well, those aren't good books because well, look, they, not many people bought them or read them, but that's because we didn't figure out how to get them exposed to people. So anyway, uh, those are things I've learned along the way and I'm gonna turn back to Charles to be MC.
Thank you, James. Um, so uh, over to you. I mean, here are some sort of questions, but uh, don't feel restricted to these. Um, and on the final slide, we will have uh, where to find out more at ACLS and JSTOR. But uh, why don't we just pass this over to you? And if you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone and uh, perhaps introducing yourself before you uh, speak or comment. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentation. Alicia Salas, University of Oregon. I'm curious if you have any plans or have talked about with this pilot and with the um, delayed open access, any plans to experiment with pricing on those published materials? Um, is the plan to price those according to a standard, uh, you know, just a standard pricing model, the traditional way, or has there been any discussion about um, possibly expanding access through a more affordable pricing versus just going from too expensive to completely open? Uh, welcome any, any thoughts or um, feedback you've heard from some of the constituents groups you've been working with on that. Alicia, that's a really interesting question. Can I just ask you a clarificatory question? So are you thinking particularly here of the sort of the price of the print book or the e-book to a consumer? Either. So, right, so if 200 libraries are going to pay 75, you know, if you drop that to 20, would you get 400 or 600, and would it be the same to the publisher, and would that be an alternative means of expanding access while waiting for that embargo to run out? Um, so, Rebecca, do you want to talk about the library side of it? Um, I certainly have some comments about the consumer pricing. Yeah, I, th I think actually it's probably more about the consumer pricing of the book itself, which would be in the publisher space. Because um, the way our fee structure is working, um, it is an annual subscription fee. So it's not specific uh, yeah. to a title yeah, for the path to open participation. Um, and I think uh, I'll just make a point about what that cost is. So at the very large institution, it's about $50 a book over the course of the, the three years. The very small institution, it's $8 a monograph, making it, if you think about the distribution of, of the funds for the subscription. But for the print side and the consumer side, yeah. I think that's a hugely interesting question. So um, there are some things, of course, that we have to leave to the publisher to um, work out. Uh, and pricing to the consumer would be one of them. But just speaking for University of Michigan Press, what we're recognizing is a really interesting space in terms of thinking eventually of the book going OA and what to price a print book at to make it still attractive as a saleable item after the book goes OA. And in general, we don't like changing our prices too much. So as we think about the prospect of these books going away in three years, we're probably going to choose pricing that considers that from the very start. So that means always doing a paperback. It also means thinking about what the consumer will, basically, if you knew there was an open access version, but you wanted to read this thing in the bath, what would you be willing to pay for the print version? So I think you're going to see a lot more pricing of paperbacks that has that at the back of the publisher's mind. And that's going to be good for access. And I think, you know, um, uh, that would also apply to our direct-to-consumer ebook copies. Fascinating. Thank you again. Thank you for that question. Um, thank you. That was uh, really interesting. Um, I wear a couple of hats, and over the years, I've had conversations with publishers about reprints. Uh, and I'm curious about how that might factor in this process. Uh, you know, I do book history but in collection development, but there is this push to try to get access to books we've recovered that we didn't know had such value, and then of course proving the value, but I'm curious if there's any, any relationship that might s say a positive nudge toward that direction of reprints. Mary Emma, thank you so much. Um, Rebecca, James, Emma? Yeah, are you talking about sort of bringing books back into print? Bringing, bo uh, bringing books that are long since yeah. out of print, maybe a very small print run, but have value as we continue to understand lots of things about culture, society, whatever. Yeah, so yes, bringing yeah. them back into print, but doing this way because publishers have said it's too expensive to reprint these books, but this is a different mechanism. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Now this project, uh, this pilot is focused on, on future publishing, like of, of new content and sustaining that, but I think that would be a great topic for the governance group to explore, uh, examining whether or not this program could have an impact on that as well. And, and just one other quick thought on that, Mariama, which is that um, a lot of times by planting something in the middle of two groups that actually could get along if they, there was some bridge between them is a good starting place. And so I think that, uh, as Rebecca said, this project is, you know, a pilot and well-defined and everything like that. But, I, you know, I, we, we've talked at different points about what about, uh, and I think Rebecca said, you know, is three years the right time? There could be an accelerate to open. Maybe there, there are certain authors or certain books that should move faster or, you know, to open. And, and your point of those books that are buried in, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a mystery zone of are they in copyright, are they out, can they be reprinted, can they not be, who would want to, everything like that. Again, once, once the common ground is established, that's the kind of thing that can, can be built on top of this, one would think. And I would add one thing, which is if you haven't met her already, and I hope uh, Mary Emma won't mind me saying this, so Dr. Mary Emma uh, Graham um, is going to be one of the presenters in the final plenary and um, is uh, somebody I've had the pleasure of getting to know through the um, ACLS Commission um, on Diverse Digital Scholarship. But her own work in uh, really uh, raising an understanding of African and African-American writers and bringing that back into, into the mix, into public awareness, I think that uh, really points to the importance of that question. And um, the governance model that we've discussed, so this is my colleague John Shearer, Director of the University of North Carolina Press, who's exploring this more with um, the Mellon Foundation. But this governance model will place uh, the voices that represent or at least uplift uh, uh, marginalized readers, marginalized writers at the center of the future of this project. So that's gonna be very, very exciting to have a really consensual governance model, a really sort of diverse governance model that will actually help with the selection of future books with the direction of this program. And I think that's one's one going, to, going to be one of the central um, exciting things about Path to Open. Uh, Sharla, could you introduce yourself please? Yes, I'm Sharla Lair from Lyricist. Um, one of the reasons why I like this model is that it's actually approaching open access, not in the diversity, equity, inclusion, angle, I mean, it, it is, but it's really coming from the, the idea around sustainability. And that's a big sticky word, especially among book publishers. Uh, what, what is that? Um, and what does that mean? And it's because book publishing hasn't necessarily been sustainable, especially for the presses represented through this model. Uh, and so I'm, what I'm wondering, and this may get to the governance, but I'm also wondering about what Emma might think about this. Is, are there plans, even within the first year, to the transparency of showing how much was raised, how much went to each publisher, and what the publisher thought as far as, it, you know, those who got the 5,000, was that good enough? Um, and for those who had that big bestseller, you know, that, that made the big bucks, you know, how does that translate into impact? How does that translate into sustainability overall for the publisher across their entire portfolio? because we'll know those are subsidizing other activities, right? How does that, I, this is getting to that big sticky question of sustainability. Um, and so is that part of the plan? Uh, just, just, just to say, I, it raises a very, very important point and it raises a point that's very uncomfortable for many of us. And I think, I don't know, I don't know, and this is probably speaking out of school, but I think it might be uncomfortable for JSTOR as well, which is there's a level of transparency that we expect uh, and will expect, I think, I hope, as a governance group about what's happening that is appropriate to open access in the way that the idea of exclusive platforms really jars that I think is going to be very, very important out of this program. And I'm hoping that it can be a way of talking about some of these things that I think, I don't know, university presses perhaps have been a bit on the defensive about. Like, what do acquisitions editors do? What is the value that they add? Because that's why we are more expensive than a scholar-led publisher. It's because we have acquisitions editors. And they go and they deeply dive into conferences and they lead in their disciplines. And we cover many, many, many disciplines. 
and that's expensive. And the question is, are libraries willing to support artisanal foods? Are they willing to support local producers? Are they willing to support um, reinvestment in local economies? Because in our personal lives, of course we are, but when we spend our acquisitions dollars, are we reinvesting in that way in things that might be a bit more expensive, but they're better for the community, for the environment, for sustainability? Uh, I'll just say, I believe, Charlotte, that there's a plan to have an annual report issued during the course of this program to make things as transparent as possible. It is absolutely not the intention to hide information about this. It is intended to be collaborative, transparent. My understanding is also that the governance board will include library scholars and publishers, and uh, that's where it'll all be held accountable, right? Because uh, they'll all have their voice in saying what information should be shared and, and um, where great conversations can happen about what is proprietary and what is not and why it is. And I always feel it's one of the most important things we can do as on the vendor publisher side is uh, openly communicate uh, what it costs to make a monograph. Where does that cost live from? How much does, you know, how much does a, a press sell of a monograph? Uh, and um, you know, sort of getting to an understanding of, of the reasons behind doing things, not just the outcomes of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Rice Majors, UC Davis. I don't know if I have a question. I have a kind of a topic, I guess. So I was able to find a study that I um, had read a long time ago, over 10 years ago, that uh, when a book is cited in scholarship, um, over 25% of the time, the book is over 25 years old. Um, so it, it can take a while for a book to be cited, um, and part of that is that the current generation of scholars heard the findings at a conference, and it really takes that next generation of scholars to need to go and read about it. And I'm wondering, I, this, this strikes me as kind of an interesting balance of just in case and just in time, because if you really needed the book, you could just buy it. But if you're doing collection development because you just want to you want to create a large collection to support the future of scholarship, you could wait the three years and it becomes available to you and to your users. And I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you have, any of you have any data like that that kind of is informing this where that three year window, I mean, I'm hearing that you tend to make 90% of your money in the first three years when you publish a book and that's kind of maybe playing into that magic. But from the user standpoint, is that three years consequential? And, and do we know that? Yeah, I don't think I could rattle off the statistics off the top of my head, but this is absolutely something that is incredibly meaningful because this scholarship, it's bought instantly when it's published because of an acquisition workflow of the library, right. not because you need it at that moment, and especially in humanities and social sciences. Um, it does take a while to work its way through that academic enterprise, right? Um, and the usage of, of JSTOR, I think 50% of our usage is like very deep backlist, um, but I, I don't have enough uh, detailed <laughs> um, response to that, but I think it's gonna be important for us to share that, and actually during the pilot, we do expect some books will be opened up faster because they'll get funding in one way or the other, or we're gonna have presses put in books that need immediate open access so that we can study the difference in what mm -hmm. happens, like in the print sales. But one thing we're definitely gonna be looking at is um, what happens with citations? Um, once these books are open, does it, you know, are we increasing the number of citations? So uh, I think that's an, a, 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 a terrific area for us to be examining the impact of yeah. this work. And I, just one more thing on the impact. On our licensed eBooks on JSTOR, where libraries have to buy them, uh, on average it's bought in 14 different countries. The open access books, of which we have almost 10,000 now out of the 130,000, 150 different countries um, use those books. Um, so the impact of open, it is getting to that underserved community everywhere, whether they're at an institution or just a, a, somebody interested in a, in a topic. Um, so, and, and it doesn't matter what the age is. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking for a humanist, it's just really hard to pivot your research yeah. agenda in real time. Yep. If you see a book that's published that's interesting, you tend to buy it so that in three mm -hmm. years you can take that up as your next project, right? I mean, unless it's really, really directly um, impacting what you're looking at right now. Um, so anyway, yeah. thank, you. thank you. I think it's a fascinating point, Rice. I, mean, I think it, um, yes, uh, it <laughs> sparks all kinds of thoughts. We know so little about what human how humanities read, uh, hum humanists read. Um, 
we've had all these studies of early career researchers in STEM and researchers in STEM, we have vanishingly few studies of what uh, is happening in early careers and uh, more mature careers in humanities disciplines. Um, it is interesting, the point about the practice of buying the book right now, putting it on the shelf, then coming to it later. Thank heavens for those people who do that, because absolutely that's happening. Uh, there's also an interesting um, uh, suggestion from Steve Fallon from De Gruyter Online that peak impact in the De Gruyter collections is achieved in two years rather than three. So why have we thought about three? And that opens up lots of questions like, what's, what do we mean by peak impact? Uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, but also that's a really interesting claim and one that is a hypothesis that now we can work on. And the final thing is, that point about 25 years, it gets at some of the discomfort the university presses feel in this open space, remembering that traditionally we've made money from our backlists, and that's how we've supported our operations. So with open access, are we eroding the potential to make backlist sales? I personally think we aren't, because I, what um, uh, Amy Brand at MIT Press has also said is that Instantaneously, our books are published. They go up online on lib Library Genesis or Sci-Hub. It's not like we're restricting access. <laughs> Anyhow, let's at least partner with libraries to <laughs> make openness a little bit more um, manageable. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Please go ahead. Thank you. Holly Mercer, University of Tennessee. Um, so I'm answering the first question and um, thinking not just as uh, a librarian, but as a librarian whose university press became a division of the University of Tennessee Libraries in 2020. And uh, I've learned a lot over the last few years, and one of the things that I have learned is that for a modest university press, um, path to open isn't just a path to open, it's also a path to ebooks. And, um, and so I see this as something that could really be transformative for one of the, the smaller university presses. Also, um, as a library, we participated in Tome, um, but our university press could never really benefit from that. We were giving funds to our UT authors to publish in uh, larger university presses, but our press publishes mostly authors that are uh, in uh, regional universities, smaller institutions that uh, don't have the resources to participate in Tome. They're not ARLs. Um, and so uh, something like this is really um, going to help our university press, I think, um, be successful in the long term. So from a sustainability perspective, um, it's, um, it's something that's really going uh, to make a big difference, I feel. Thanks. Okay. Heather Heckman, University of South Carolina. Um, to Holly's point about Tome, we did not participate, but we had some of the same obstacles. Um, our press is not part of the libraries, but we are trying to work closer together. Uh, I was gonna ask a follow-up question about the statistics you shared, and I understand if you do not have this off the top of your head, but when you say average, is that a mean or a median? I assume that it's kind of a skewed distribution with like a few books having a lot of places that are maybe pulling it up. Yeah, I don't know that I can, I don't wanna answer any more in depth because I will Fair be enough. wrong. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I, I will Thanks. possibly be wrong, but I think this is an area we have to explore, and I think, um, through uh, like the uh, pages on, on about Paths to Open, we should start like thinking about those questions and talking about them and, and sharing some of that usage. It's come up in a, a couple of the conversations, just um, trying to better understand the impact of, of that, um, uh, the, of the delay uh, to the open access and whether it's meaningful or not. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is probably just stating the obvious, but uh, I care about the full distribution, not just like where the center is, you know, um, and I bet that the presses do as well, because you're looking at that when you're working on your budgets. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I think it really fits into perhaps the, uh, the conversation we had uh, at the last um, session around usage statistics, you know, lies, lies, and damned usage statistics. I mean, it's like uh, if we're not being actually 
asking those questions about the methodology and about what we're actually talking about, we're going to have a lot of wild claims without context. So thank you so much for that. And I just pointing out, so University of Tennessee Press, if you want to know about Appalachia, you go to University of Tennessee Press. Uh, if you want to know about the civil rights movement, you go to University of South Carolina Press. I mean, these are perfect examples of presses that manifest in their focus, in their um, academic publishing, the concerns and perspectives of their regions. So important. And you're publishing those books because they're important to publish, not because you think they're going to reach um, a million copy sales. Um, and, and your motivation to publish that type of content is very, very different. And collectively distributing the investment from the community in a way that helps support that, I think, uh, is, is one of the aims of this program, for sure. Any other observations or comments? Uh, anything from the panelists that has struck you during this conversation? I mean, I would say, Charles, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, libraries who are very verbal and upfront in their support for university presses, whether that university press is part of the library or not. And I mean, I, I think these last two comments really get to that because um, we're, we're thinking a lot about making sure we have that bibliodiversity within the books that we acquire within, within our own library. And then we are also met with this uh, sort of complicated aspect that I think is part of that that you know journal stem history of now being responsible for how are we helping our own campus authors publish open access and so I, I think that's just those are two things that we're thinking about in sometimes in the same moment but sometimes very separately from one another so I just wanted to highlight that on, on those last comments when we kind of think about a program like Tome which was really doing that work of here is a way that our campus authors have access to creating and uh, publishing an open access book and then thinking on the other side of that how do we think more holistically about our, our collections and our readers and placing open access within within maybe that sort of part of our of our brain so um, thank you for those those last two comments I think that really highlights that connection and Bruce thank you uh, th this is really a question for James um, introduce so, yourself oh sorry, sorry Bruce Hederick with uh, JSTOR and Ithaca at the end of the day what's the ACLS want to see out of this uh, please start by defining the end of the day <laughs> <laughs> um, not today but three years from now I mean, I, you know, one of the things that's nice, I used to go to CNI a lot, I didn't go for a couple of years, and it's so nice to be back here because of the collisions of networks that happen, you know, at, at a place like this. So, I mean, obviously there, there's a strong network of, of, of deans of librarians, uh, deans of libraries, and of AULs for technology, but when we, when introduced into a group like this of someone doing something different, like those clear fellows yesterday, I think everyone's like, oh, I like to hear about what you're doing and what's going on out there. And what happens, I think, a lot is that we don't collide our networks. We barely have time to be, have the networks that we have, right? And so the, the section before this about use, you know, the, the layers of work that we all collectively need to figure out how to do in order to track usage of publicly available assets, right, and, uh, works and citations. I mean, there's so much work that goes into infrastructure, and we all see the gaps in infrastructure. And so the, the end of the day for us is, again, just um, seeing scholars who, you know, th there, there are all sorts of mythologies about open access policy, you know, publishing. I, I shouldn't publish my book open because, because then I wouldn't have a book to hold. Well, you actually can have a book to hold. Okay, but so, you know, just displacing that myth is one thing. And then, you know, and then, and then, and there are, and some of these myths are based in reality. Will I get credit for it? Well, my, well, how will my department look at it? Well, part of that is, again, tracking usage. Like, wouldn't your department want your book to be read a lot and cited a lot? That would be a good thing, right? Like, so if we constrain how, how access, how much access there is to your book, it's going to be used less, and your scholarship will be valued less. And what is value? And right now we have such narrow definitions. So there's so much that we can do, especially as if we want humanistic fields to thrive and move forward, right? Like we want, we want people to be able to publish long form works, right? And particularly in fields that uh, you know they haven't had that opportunity to not have the bibliodiversity that we're talking about. So so for the end of the day, for us, I mean, this is a long answer, but. You asked the 
big question. Um, I think the ACLS's interest in this is that there, there are just some sort of gaps in sort of obvious solutions that can help everyone involved. You know, the, the people who write the books want to read the books. The libraries that are paying for books want more books, and they want them not just for themselves. Obviously, they have to account. They're writing a check, right? You're going to get some books. You're going to get some value for this, right? But you, knowing at the same time that at an end of an embargo period, it's going to open up to the world, and that's going to help your authors, and it's going to help your scholars. Um, you know, it, it, so the, it, it's such a... To me, this is a win-win about, about lifting the whole collective infrastructure of how we get uh, the hard work of writing a book disseminated. So, so if we can you know, help to uh, be a place where some of those networks collide, that's great. So on that note, I'll just ask you one question, which is, wouldn't your lunch be much better if you had an orange pen? <laughs> Uh, but you also have to take a DOAB leaflet if you take one. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to the audience. Thank you.